Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram. Instagram.com slash Great Detectives. Today's program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net. You can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Now, we will have a special announcement after today's podcast. That will be of interest, and I encourage you to listen for that. But now let's get into this week's episode of Sam Spade. The original air date, January 19th, 1951, and the title is The Cloak and Dagger Caper. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Detective Agency. Miss Perrine. Who did you think it was, Sam? Not a hurry? You don't know what a hot guess that is, Cherub. Really, Sam? Mm-hmm. You think I'm the femme fatale type? In a black velvet gown with a veil? What chance would I have? Sam, you've given me new heart. Deservedly so, Wonder Girl. And in femme fatale, you have hit upon what might be called the keynote of the saga, which even now I am itching to tell you. A saga? More. A tale, Effie, well calculated to keep you in... Oh, no, we better put that another way. But while I mull a subtitle for this oriental tapestry, find yourself a copy of something by Eric Ambler or E. Phillips Oppenheim and bone up on the ground rules of international intrigue. Ooh, international? Ooh, yes. The next 39 steps you hear will be me walking up to the door in my black Homburg and velvet collar with my pockets bulging with plans for submarines, supersonic airplanes, and secret fortifications, and my tongue a-wag with a report which will echo around the embassies of the world as... The Cloak and Dagger Caper. For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Sam? Who else? I thought you were kidding. About what? The black Homburg and velvet-colored overcoat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But underneath the overcoat, eh? Same old Sam. (sighs) With the same old suit and the same old shreds. Who did it this time? Thereby hangs the tail. (laughs) Huh? It's hanging off the back of your trousers, Sam. What? Your shirt tail. Well, better keep the coat on. Jawara Hal won't mind. Who? Jawara Hal Barra. It's his coat. We'll go into that right now. You ready? Yes, sir. To... Jawara Hal Barra. J-A-W-A-R-H-A-L-B-H-A-R-A, uh-huh. Well, speaking... From Samuel Say, license number 127596. Subject... The Cloak and Dagger Caper. Dear Jawara Hal. I'd been out Friday night until 4 a.m. watching wedding presents. So when Saturday turned up rainy, I did the mad, impulsive thing and decided to stay home. I plugged the phone, built a fire and a tall drink, invited Freddy, the neighbor's cat, in for a short milk, put my feet up and my head down, and reached for a magazine. A picture of peace, Juara Hal. Freddy lay on the coffee table, purred, and busied himself spinning the hand-rubbed Lazy Susan my unpredictable Aunt Adelaide gave me for Christmas. The magazine turned out to be time, with a picture of an austere Asiatic gentleman on the cover. Two pages, and I had the kind of headache you can only get from reading the news these days. So I turned it in on a slick pulp with a breathless yarn about an international gumshoe and a satin-lined cloak who kept running into women with bosoms full of papers. Hmm. See, she gazed up at him, her eyes smoldering, heavy-lidded. You, she faltered, you are Sheridan Ballard. Mr. G, too? He nodded. Her knife made a glistening arc, stopping as his hand met her wrist, gripping it like a vise. You, you liar, she hissed. With the other hand, he ripped away her veil, smothered her lips in hot, fierce kisses, felt her go limp in his arms. Now, Zelda, my girl, he whispered, let's have the plans for that plutonium-powered rocket ship. Ah! 
veiled ladies, yes. Mr. Spade? Huh? Well. <clears throat> what can I do for you, veiled lady? You do not mind that I come in so? How did you come in so? The door is open. I see sitting in chair an attractive man. So. So. You are perhaps working on a remake of The Thief of Baghdad for television. Black tube, of course. Oh, you mean uh, this what I have on? Also this what you haven't on. You keep out of this, Freddy. I saw her first. So, you just happened to be wandering past my door and popped in, is that it? Miss, uh... You may call me Shalimar. Hmm. No, no. I do not just pop in. I come by design. Well, just what kind of designs do you have in mind? Mr. Spade, hmm? you are private eyes. Shalimar, I am private eyes. You got troubles? Much. How much? I am beloved of Ahmed. Well, that's nice for Ahmed. Ahmed who? McClatchy. Ahmed McClatchy? How do you explain that? He has two American names. Oh, figure, figure. Mm -hmm. You are a friend of Ahmed, too? Never heard of him. Oh, Perhaps, Mr. Spade, perhaps uh, you forget. Ahmed McClatchy? No. No? Never forget a face. What's the matter with Ahmed? Hashish. Dope? Much. He has the wild dream, the night horse, the what you call hallucination. Hallucination. Yeah. You have told others of Ahmed's visit to you? I have told no one of Ahmed's visit to me for the simple reason that he... Oh. Huh? <laughs> Do not file upon one falsehood another. Well, Ahmed has to you paid a visit, this I know. Oh? Now, if you will be so kindly... I will join you in dream. Now, wait a minute. Why don't we... Sure, sure, sure. Mm -hmm. You uh, do not want to talk with Shalimar? Well, I uh, just think we ought to clear up this misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now? What do you have? Had I been the Sultan and she Shahrazad, the book would have gone on for 20 more volumes. It was all there, the veil below the eyes, the jacket and long satin pants, plus a superabundance of what sultans look for when they are employing a harem. I fumbled around putting, I don't know what, into a couple of martinis, found more milk for Freddy's saucer, and then set all three between us on Aunt Adelaide's Lazy Susan. <laughs> <laughs> this I like, Mr. Spade. Fine, fine. Now we talk. Uh, drink your milk, Freddy. Now we talk. Oh, uh, you have match. Oh, I, oh, my purse. Oh, I'll get it for you. Oh, move now. You're almost stepping on it. Oh, so clumsy. Uh, the lipsticks, it's on the chair. Yeah, I see it. I, there we are. Thank you. No now, uh, the light. Got it. Uh-huh. <laughs> now, Mr. Spade, before we talk of Ahmed, let us drink to him, huh? Right. To Ahmed? To Ahmed. Oh, what's the matter, Freddy? Oh, oh, oh. oh. Cat? Yeah, look, uh, milk's on the wrong side. He did it again. Did, did what? Well, he likes to spin the lazy Susan. Lazy Susan? What did he do? Now, take it easy, honey. The thing spins. See, you got my drink, I got yours, and Freddy got left out. That's no. A... Oh, no! Daryl! You look, Daryl! Look, baby, please, oh. don't go off the deep end. Take it easy. What's the, what's the matter with you? Oh. Huh? Shalimar. Oh, Shalimar, baby. Come out of it now, will you? Where's the glass? Oh. Lionate. So that took care of Shalimar. The purse had nothing except the usual feminine claptrap, hairpins, makeup, and cigarettes. No keys, no identification, nothing except for a locket around her neck, which was something you don't run into every day. A strange hand-wrought disc-shaped thing with what looked like the face of a clock on it. Twelve Arabic symbols where the hours should be and a pair of hands pointing to four. In some Jawara Hal, it was the sort of thing Sheridan Ballard, the man called G2, yawns over, which struck humdrum me as a little bit out of the ordinary. It struck Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide the same way. Look at me, Sam. Look into my eyes. Dundee, I didn't know you cared. Well, I don't... Uh... No, I am not an idiot, Sam. Well, uh, I've been in this business for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I've looked at a lot of stiffs in my lifetime, yes. but this is the first hoochie-coochie girl in my book who ever walked in out of the rain and tried to poison a total stranger. Well said, Dundee. Hear, hear. So? So? So use your head, Sam. 
Where have you seen her before? I told you I don't know her, Dundee. Then why did she try to kill you? Ask her. Ah, this whole thing's impossible. Hmm? Harem costume, poison, Shalimar. Fantastic, I know. I'm sorry. All right, get out of here. The print man, the M.E., and the photographers will be here in a minute, and you'll only get in the way. Where'll I go? Anywhere. Find out who this dame is. Who's going to pay my fee? Well, I... Scram. <laughs> Bidding farewell to the gentle lieutenant, I took off into the rain, bound I knew not where. I bought a paper and settled down in a one-armed coffee joint, drank three cups of coffee, and came up with three leads. First, the ballet master at the opera house. Scheherazade, we are not doing till three weeks yet. The costumes are all packed up still, and I am missing no ballerinas. Now again, golden apple princesses. One and two. Yes, she wiggles and waggles, she shimmies and shakes. You never, never saw anything like this, folks. So hurry, hurry, hurry. Direct from a Turkish harem, little Fatima, the girl with the double-jointed... Jack. Yeah, Jack? You're sure she's in there, Jack? Wait a minute, Jack. Yeah, she's in there, man. Thanks, ma'am. All right, folks, step in a little closer. She shakes. Sorry, but can't help you a bit. This here Turkish bat is 100% stag. Homeward bound, I was walking down Grant Avenue when I passed a little shop near Pine Street. Gold lettering on one corner of the window spelled out Hatchadurian J. Pappas, importer, curios. How do you do, sir? Hatchadurian J. Pappas? You get the pleasure. What's the J for? Never mind, kiddo. You can pronounce it. I accept your apology. Now, will you take a look at this? Huh? Oh, locket, huh? Uh-huh. Yes, locket it is. Where do you get this locket, ki- uh, sir? I, uh, I found it. I thought you might recognize it. Yeah, hey, I think I do. Good. You know, strange you should have come here. And yet, not so strange either, if you want to look on it. Well, which is it? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, I'm perhaps the only fella in town who might have dealt in this kind of stuff here. It's quite uh, genuine. Oh, you mean you sold this? Probably. Sure, sure. Who, who to? I'm trying to remember. A girl? A girl. Or, or was it a fella? I... A young fella? Or old fella? Well, that leaves only one more category. Huh? An old woman. Oh, you know her then? No, no, I don't know her, no. You know, I wish I could remember to whom I sold it to. Yes. It's I... been such a long time, you know. Of course, I can look it up and call you, Sport. Good. Here's, uh, here's my card. Oh, Sam Sport. Uh, well, if you want to look at it. Uh, you said it's uh, genuine, huh? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, secret society medallion. 16th century. It's from the Indian state of Kashmir. Kashmir? Sure, kiddo. Kashmir. What's the matter with you? Don't you understand English? <laughs> Kashmir. A typical spade blunder. All I could think of was a girl on a cigarette package, thereby confining my operations to Turkey. But this opened new doors. The first, the most obvious, and ultimately the correct choice, was a flossy nightclub known to the town's well-heeled party folk as the Vale of Kashmir. It was dark when I got there, but the front doors hadn't opened yet. Around at the side, an alley led up to the trade entrance, next to which stood a huge wedge-shaped character with a swarthy complexion marred by a scar down one cheek. And to make him even more Oppenheimish, he was wrapped in a black, tent-sized opera cloak. I nodded politely, he spat, and I went inside. The Vale of Kashmir is a sumptuous bistro even on ordinary nights, and this night was obviously to be more than ordinary. The table across the end of the floor was banquet-sized. The place was hung with Kashmiri flags, and the picture of an old man who looked familiar was hung from the middle of one wall. The maitre d' was talking to an important-looking gent near the long table, and I walked over to them, pausing only to note one of the dancing girls practicing in a corner in her Shalimar-type costume. Felt like I was close to home. <laughs> and the curry, you understand? Not too hot, yes, Excellency. It shall be as you wish. The florist will be here promptly with the flowers. Mm-hmm. I trust you will be prepared to take care of uh, them. Excuse when... me, gentlemen. Eh? My name is Spade. Lush put seeing, sir, at your service. Please, right? Mr. Spade, we have... No, 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 not at all, not at all, my good what? man. 
What is it, Mr. Spade? Are you uh, in charge here? I am the head waiter, sir. This gentleman is the Kashmiri proconsul. Oh, forgive me, Your Excellency, but... Uh, yeah, sorry. Not at all. Uh, do you have a dancing girl here named Shalimar? Shalimar? No. What? Probably use another name. How about Ahmed? McClatchy. Right. Where is he? A former employee as of this afternoon is Ahmed McClatchy. Who? Who is he? My chef. Today of all times, he does not show up. You know where he lives? No, I can look it up, but... Please, sir, the proconsul and I, the banquet tonight, the arrangements, the prime minister himself sure, is our sure, guest. Sure, sure, sure. Just uh, one more thing. A proconsul, have you ever seen one of these before? Hmm. What is it? A secret society medallion, they tell me. Who... Who tells you this? Hachadurian Pappas. Runs a little curio store on Grand Avenue. Know anything about it? Secret society is right. The circle of twelve. You see here? Hmm? The hands point to four. Yes, the fourth member, this means. The hand straight up is the leader. You seem to know what you are talking about, head waiter. <laughs> Kashmiri culture is a hobby of mine, Excellency. This is an ancient, uh, how do you say, subversive organization dating from the time of the Mughal conquest of the 16th century. Very interesting. Yes. But of little significance now. The Circle of Twelve has been dead for three centuries. Uh, if you will excuse me, Excellency, I'll get for Mr. Spade Ahmed's address and then I will... Hold it. Ahmed! just made it to the table, swept the sugar bowl off it, and followed it to the deck. When I saw the dagger in his back, I grabbed my gun and set sail for the alley, looking for the cloak that went with it, but he was gone. So was Ahmed. I bent down over him, took a closer look, and saw why he spilled the sugar. With his finger, he traced a design in it, a round design, the circle of 12. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective... Sam Spade. There's a bright newcomer to your NBC Sunday lineup starting this Sunday. It's Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. Now you can follow the further delightful adventures of the beleaguered Blandings in their famous dream house every Sunday. Starring as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings will be Cary Grant and his charming wife, Betsy Drake. Mr. and Mrs. Blandings is followed over most of these NBC stations by The Big Show. And this Sunday, hostess Tallulah Bankhead will present such bright stars as Fred Allen, Judy Holliday, Patrice Munsell, Gypsy Rose Lee, Vaughn Monroe, and many, many more. The chimes are your invitation. <laughs> Now back to the Cloak and Dagger Caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Well, Jawara, all the ingredients of a first-class international goulash were here. The cloak, the dagger, the man with a scar on his face, the lady with a veil over hers, and two corpses. By now, Dundee had completed activities with corpse number one at my apartment, so I hustled him down to the Vale of Cashmere and put him to work on number two. Then I hustled back to my office. The big question had yet to be answered. Sam? Not another. Oh, Sam! Hmm? Now you always love your phone. I've been trying to call you for hours. About Ackman McClatchy, right? And the girl with the veil. Shalimar. Is that her name? Probably not, but it doesn't matter to her now. What about Ackman? Oh, he was frightened out of his wits. He said somebody was going to kill him, and I told him he'd come to just the right place because you were strong and brave and good. wonderful. Good. And, and he cried. Good. And I cried. Good, good. But wait, wait, wait. Hold it, F. Yes, Sam? What happened when all the crying was over? Well, I sent him up to see you, Sam. I couldn't he call. He just told so... you somebody was going to kill him, that's all? Yes, Sam. That's why he was crying? Oh, no, Sam, no. That's not why Ackman was crying. Why? He didn't care for himself. He's, he's a, a selfless... Generous child. Angel child. Who was Ahmed crying over? The man in the paper. What paper? Well, it's in all the papers, Sam. The Chronicle and the Examiner and the Call and, and even on the cover of Time this week. You see? A banquet. That's whose picture it was. The Jawaharlal Bara, the, mm. the Prime Minister of Kashmir. Look at the small print underneath, Sam. On him, the hopes of Asia. You see, that's what hurt Ahmed, Sam. Not for himself. He said they're going to kill Sir Jawara Hall. <laughs> 
Two paragraphs later, my taciturn secretary let slip the information that Shalimar had arrived at the office five minutes after Ahmed left and departed for my home and hearth loaded for bear. The hullabaloo over you, Jawara Hall, was due to the fact that you were at this moment arriving on the steamer Pacifica, en route to Washington with, as the article put it, the destiny of the Middle East in your briefcase. Ten minutes later, I was fighting my way through the mob at Pier 42. Not just a mob, mind you, but an assortment of bands, a Hindu delegation, the full membership of the Sanskrit Society at the University of California with a huge banner reading, Jawara Hal, we're with you, and an overripe soprano on a pedestal singing, Pale Hands I Love. I struggled through this to the curb just in time to see you pull away in your special limousine, then climbed over some more backs to a phone booth. Pale hands I love you. I am a Kashmiri consulate. Rajput Singh speaks. Look, this is Sam Spade, Mr. Singh. Oh, oh, yes. Has the prime minister arrived there yet? He's due any minute. Why? Well, you better call out the guard. They're going to try to assassinate him tonight. My good man, do you realize My what good you... man, I know whereof I speak. The cook at the restaurant. Ahmed. Yes. That is what... Yes, you're getting the idea, all right. It's the old circle of 12 with a brand new paint job. Now get on it. <laughs> My next move may sound to you like a combination of negligence, indolence, and ennui, Jawara Hal, but I must remind you that I was not employed on this caper, was receiving no stipend for risking my ever-loving neck, and had added up the figures in the problem of primary interest to me, namely, the lady who tried to kill me on page two. I therefore entrusted responsibility for your health and that of the Middle East to the proconsul, made my way home, put on my slippers, and set the lazy Susan on the floor this time for Freddie to play with. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, Zelda, my girl, he whispered, let's have the plans for that plutonium-powered rocket ship. Mm. Somehow, this all seems logical now. Never, she breathed. Rather death, Mr. G2, than to betray my country. Quiet, Freddy. Mm. Oh, no, 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 not the butter. No. Oh, no, no. Mr. Spade. Uh, oh, hello, pro uh, May I? Do, do, do. I have taken every precaution. The Prime Minister, he's on his way to the banquet now. Good. There's one thing I must ask of you. Oh? Absolute secrecy. Yes. The mere knowledge of that such an organization as this... this Circle of Twelve? Yes, exists will give added strength to a disloyal opposition in our country that may express itself in a manner disastrous to our purposes in sending Jawaharlal to Washington. You understand? Well, it's taking me a while to learn the ground rules in the International League, but I get the general idea. Uh, you you have spoken of this to no one. No? Oh, oh, excuse me. Hello? This is Hachidurian the Papa, sir. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Uh, it took me a great deal of long time to check my records, Mr. Spade, but I finally found it. Oh, what's that? The gentleman who bought the set of 12 Kashmiri medallions, like the one you saw me in my shop. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, his name is Rajput Singh. A foreigner fellow, I think. He's the Kashmiri proconsul here. Oh. Oh, well, uh, gosh, thanks, Dorothy. This is Hajidurian the Papa, sir. You f- I found it just now... Look, Dorothy, a... after all you've done for Alice, the least she could do is thank you. And you can tell her that from me. Now, bye, honey. So long, kiddo. Silly kid. Silly. Let's see now, uh, where were we? Uh, you had just given me your assurance you would maintain strictest secrecy in this unfortunate matter. Oh, yes, yes. Now, I must go. They're expecting me at the banquet there. Thank you again, sir. Not at all. Your service to our country and the world will find expression, I hope, on some later day. Good night. Good night. Freddy, please, not now. It's on the phone. Well, cloak and dagger in the flesh. Going modern on me with that gun, aren't you? Put down the phone. What if I told you I'd already made the call? I'd say you were lying. The line is tapped outside. You figure the angle's hefty. In my business, I have to. When's it coming off? For the prime minister any minute. For you right now. Oh. He's got you fooled too, huh? Stay right there. Who? Rashford. You're a fall guy, you know, doing the heavy stuff. If it kicks back, you get it, and the other ten laugh. You could talk me out of it, huh? Why, that's the last thing in my mind. I'd never... (laughs) 
Everything happened at once. As near as I can recall, it began when Cloak and Dagger backed onto Freddy's tail. Freddy yowled, spun like a top, and C&D off-balance put his other foot on Aunt Adelaide's lazy Susan. Hardly a place for a big off-balance man to place his only remaining foot. <laughs> About then, I kicked him in the stomach, grabbed at the gun, which skidded into a corner, and we went over and over for a while. C&D tore at my suit with his claws and teeth. I beat his head with an ashtray, and Freddy sat quietly in the corner and washed himself. At length, tiring of the ashtray, I beat his head on the radiator. And dear Cloak and Dagger gave it up with a long, unhappy sigh. This is a dress-up affair. I Get out of my way, head waiter, or I'll walk right over that white shirt front. Please, I can't... Have they been served anything yet? Uh, the drinks are just coming on. I wait, oh. wait, I can just go on. <laughs> and now, now, my countrymen, before we introduce our guest of honor, Sir Jawara Halbara, our beloved prime minister, I suggest we rise and toast our country. <laughs> To Kashmir, may she... Go ahead, proconsul. Don't let me interrupt. Uh, please, not here. The standard remark is, what is the meaning of this? Aren't you going to ask me? I'm supposed to be dead. Is that what's throwing you? Mr. Spade, please, a toast is about to be drunk. Cannot... Where's my drink, proconsul? <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen. There was at one time a custom in our country for the host to exchange glasses with the guest of honor. Permit me, Jawarahal. To... To Kashmir. And the moral of this story, if there is one, is when danger threatens, don't hire a bodyguard, buy a cat and a lazy Susan. Period. End of report. Why do people do these things? Oh, we all have different loyalties, have different ideas about duty. Yes? My duty, for instance, is to pick up a knot in my head and a suit full of holes once a week. While your duty is You don't is need to... to draw a diagram, Sam. I, I can take a hint. Scoot. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, Theater Guild on the Air presents a light, laughable, lovable comedy. It's The Fortune Hunter, and it stars Gene Crane and John Lund. You're invited Sunday to another outstanding one-hour production by Theater Guild on the Air. And a reminder, there's a bright newcomer to your big Sunday lineup on NBC. Mr. and Mrs. Blanding, starring Cary Grant and Betsy Drake. <laughs> Ah, how can I do this? Something wrong? Wrong, the papers. The plutonium-powered rocket ship? What else? A dumper if I ever read one, F. The plans turned out sour. Oh, what were they? The veil lady had entered a breakfast cereal contest. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's life, little one. We struggle, we strive, we think we have success in our grasp, and it turns out dross. Oh, that reminds me. Hmm? How do you like it? What? My new dross. Hmm. <laughs> And uh, that concludes the dialogue for tonight. Except for one thing, of course. Oh, I'm ready, Sam. Mm. Mm. Uh, who wants to be the man called X? He has a different one every week. I am the man called Spade. Constant, faithful, Semper Fidelis. That's me. Good night, Mr. Fidelis. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. The Magnificent Montague next, then it's Duffy's Tavern on NBC.
Welcome back. I don't think Sam has had a cat in previous episodes, but I do like it for him. I think it's a good development. Now, I actually had a sense of what Sam was talking about, even though the term Lazy Susan is not uh, used, I don't think, as much in modern discussion, but it's essentially a turntable tray put it on a table or somewhere and you can just turn the lazy Susan around without having to move everything else or move around an object to get to it. Those things just have so many different uses and of course if you've got a cat and the lazy Susan's not too big for the cat, it's a cat toy. One thing that does impress me on listening to other NBC programs is how people made commercials about the man called X and inserted references into their programs about the man called X without having any clue how the series actually worked. I mean, we've talked before about the whole... uh, he man without a name. You know, Ken Thurston, the man without a name. And then we get this one, which says that Ken Thurston has a different girl every week. I mean, Ken Thurston has a different speech every week. He rarely gets the girl. I mean, particularly once you get past the first CBS season. But you can get these ideas into the culture about what a series is like, what it's about, and how it works that have no relation to what it is actually like to watch or listen to or experience a particular series. And it's interesting to hear this on the network that's actually releasing The Man Called X. And it's just fascinating that you can have a cultural image of a production that has no relation to what it's actually like. All right, well now it's time for that promised announcement, and that is that we will be starting a new podcast in addition to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. It's called the Old Time Radio Snack Wagon. And it's going to feature some shorter old-time radio programs, as well as clips from longer series. We've got some really fun stuff to share, and I hope that you'll join us. Uh, We will be releasing the first episode on August the 7th. We'll have a sneak peek of that first episode on Sunday, August the 6th. And of course, we will play the trailer at the end of this episode. And you can again go and subscribe over at snackwagon.net or uh, wherever you get your podcast from. We've got the trailer up now. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And I want to go ahead and thank Marinus. Marinus has been one of our Patreon supporters since February, currently supporting the program at the Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Marinus. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying this podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download it from. We'll be back next Monday with another episode of Sam Spade. And then a week from Saturday, we'll be bringing you some previously uncirculated episodes of Indictment. But join us back here tomorrow for yours truly, Johnny Dollar, where... So glad you can make it, Johnny. Are you sure you want to be trying to talk, Bert? Look, why don't we forget I it now? I have to talk. Well, well, I can, Johnny. They tried to kid me, tell me I'll be out of here in a couple of days. <laughs> that line, I saw the chart. Internal, internal bleeding. And... Hey, Bert. Bert, take it easy, will you? Look, the doc said you have to take it easy. Why can't your gal Jan tell me all I need to know on the case? She can't accept this. It's getting run down. Yeah, she said she thought it wasn't an accident. She thinks? I know. Yeah? Phone calls. Threatening phone calls. Threatening? About what, Bert? Because... 
cause of holding up on this claim. Somehow somebody found out I'd, I called Hartford. Asked for investigation. Who? Nagin denies that he... The owner of the Jolly Roger? Uh, yeah. Denies knowing anything about the calls, but they weren't kidding Johnny. That's why I'm here. Then they probably know I was asked to come out here. Johnny. Yeah? Johnny better go back. Drop this one. Oh, Bert. If they do know, if they know you're here, they may try. May try to... Johnny. Yeah? Hurts. Hurts, Johnny. Nurse. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. And from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off and sharing a trailer for our new podcast project. Step into a world that was at the Old Time Radio Snack Wagon. We're your ticket to the golden age of radio, serving up weekly samples of classic comedy, captivating dramas, riveting news programs, and so much more. Get ready for a unique blast from the past straight to your ears. Subscribe to the Old Time Radio Snack Wagon for free at snackwagon.net or wherever you get your podcast.